little more than an hour after Ms. Powell, Mr. Giuliani, General Flynn, and the others finally left the White House, President Trump sent the tweet on the screen now, telling people to come to Washington on January 6th. Be there, he instructed them. Will be wild. As you will see, this was a pivotal moment. This tweet initiated a chain of events. The tweet led to the planning for what occurred on January 6th, including by the Proud Boys, who ultimately led the invasion of the Capitol and the violence on that day. That was January 6th Select Committee Vice Chair Liz Cheney tying that now infamous December 19th tweet by Donald Trump to the perpetrators of the most brutal violence that took place on January 6th. We're back with Luke Broadwater, Michael Steele, Katie Benner, and David Plupp. Um, Michael Steele, I'm coming to you, but I, I want to quickly ask Luke, do, do we know if this interview is ongoing? We got our, our cameras in the hallway, saw some motion outside the room, but we weren't sure if it was Cipollone coming or going. No, I, well, I heard, obviously I'm not there right now, but I heard that it was ending uh, momentarily when, just a few minutes ago. So um, I, I don't know 100%, sorry. Okay, we'll keep an eye out. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Um, Michael Steele, this relationship between Donald Trump and the extremist groups is so public, it's almost disorienting. In his debate performance to the Proud Boys, what do you want me to say? What do you, I disavow, stand back and stand by, and then come to Washington, be there, we'll be wild. Whatever excuse making goes on in any sort of criminal defense context, should that come to pass, it is undeniable that there was a call and answer between Donald Trump and the domestic violent extremist groups. Absolutely. And in fact, uh, I, I don't mean to correct you. Uh, I wouldn't say it's disorienting. I say it's very orienting. I think it yeah. very much clarifies for Fair. us um, Fair. how Donald Trump saw these groups. They saw him, um, at, they saw, he saw them as an extension of his efforts uh, to retain power uh, by any means necessary. And they saw him as an extension of their efforts to gain legitimacy, to gain uh, control and power um, within uh, political institutions uh, and influence. And it was a symbiosis that, that worked for both of them. And, and so I, you know, I think a lot of the hand-wringing and hand-holding around uh, the roles that certain groups played and whether they were this or that or how close they were, it, it didn't matter. I mean, it was very, very clear and from the debate on where Donald Trump, and even before then, where Donald Trump was headed, what he thought um, he needed uh, as instruments to help him achieve those goals. And those groups, whether it's Proud Boys, Three Percenters, or whatever they call themselves, they were readily available. He was not interested in having them to just stand down. He wanted them to stand by. And he made it very clear that there was more to come. And and they and they came. Uh, they stormed the Capitol. They, or they were part of that infrastructure uh, on that day. Um, and the January 6th committee is, is putting that out in stark relief for the country to see, which is why I believe in some sense um, the, the country's num the number of viewers in this is, is not fallen off, but stayed steady right. and increases uh, because people are curious and interested in how this turns out. Well, and Michael Steele, to, to your point, uh, this relationship between Trump and the extremist groups the decision to have this hearing last was made at the beginning. I mean, this was always going to be one of the last public uh, offerings, if you will. And Congressman Raskin, I think with Stephanie Murphy, has been working on this one since before the public hearings began. If you go back to the kinds of things that Stuart Rhodes' wife said when he was charged, I mean, mm -hmm. she talked a, a whole lot about what Rhodes thought Trump's role was vis-a-vis -vis her husband. And it was he was waiting for him to invoke the Insurrection Act. I mean, do you think they're going to show evidence, sort of smoking gun evidence of connectivity between the insurrectionists and Donald Trump? You know, that's a very good question. And I think that's, um, that's a tempting thought, particularly in light of the Proud Boys leadership of the gentleman who's currently incarcerated indicating, hey, yeah, I'll come talk, but I want live coverage and I want these things. Um, right. We'll, we'll see. We'll see exactly how the how the hammer is being wielded uh, between the committee and the DOJ with respect to some of these players to get them to to uh, to make that connectivity. I believe it's there um, just based on my my own observance and reading 
of, of what's been going on, it's there. Uh, and I think DOJ has become much more comfortable that it's there. Um, that could mm -hmm. lead to some criminal uh, relief, um, judicial relief with respect to Donald Trump. Um, and, and I think that the committee knows it's there. Um, and uh, quite honestly, I'd say don't think about shutting down until you're done. You got until the end of the year. You got until the new Congress comes in. Um, let the evidence take you where you need to go. Uh, do not be, uh, you know, blocked by the impending elections. Do not be forestalled by an interregnum between the elections and the new Congress. Do the work on behalf of the American people. Get those people to sign on the dotted line their narratives that fills in those very critical pieces that tie this bow right around Donald Trump.